Today, I'm going to chat with you about the first 2020 Democratic primary presidential debate that took place in Miami last night on MSNBC. But first, I would like to just say, oh my God, it is so wonderful to finally be clean shaven and wear my favorite clothes and not feel like there is dust all over me and that I don't have to dress to be dirty or wear the clothes that I'm okay with getting dirty as I'm in the process, as you know, of moving into this new wonderful condo here in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. You may recall if you've been watching this vlog in sequential order that I have been chatting about moving someplace better. However, I will be taking a brief respite from that theme, that topic, that subject, to cover the presidential debates taking place, the one last night and the one tonight. Before I delve into that, well, a few things. First, I should say, it's, it's interesting because yesterday I talked about how being how how going x amount of time without shaving reminded me of bad times and now uh, finally getting the chance to be clean shaven and dress nice and feel good and clean and all that reminds me of other interesting times and actually another period in which I had moved from one place to another so if being long bearded and unshaven reminds me, for example, of the bad times living in South Beach. Being clean shaven reminds me of when I lived uh, with Ashley in Lawrenceville. The context of that move is complicated and I'm not going to get into it now, but it was in roughly 2011, I believe, the summer of 2011. Interestingly, almost exactly this time, back in 2011, so Wow, eight years ago now. Wow. No, that just can't be. It just can't be. I, where does the time go? Where does it go? I, my mind is blown. Anyway, I was in a state of, I think, this deep depression and frustration with life, not happy about where we lived in Lawrenceville. We lived in the bottom floor of a, it was a condo or an apartment and, or a townhouse or something in Lawrenceville. We shared the living unit with two other people. There's a guy who owned the unit, so I guess it was a con, I want to say it was a condo in Lawrenceville. There was this guy, he was in his 70s, I want to say, British, uh, and he had been a chemist and he was uh, mad, filthy. He left all of his fruit to rot in the kitchen and he wanted to just let the flies naturally gravitate towards it and feed on it. Uh, this was his style. It was really disgusting. The b bottom level that we lived in was overburdened with dust. However, there was a small little desk and Ashley was willing to let me use that desk for my writing and reading, the gracious darling that she is. It was the first time I had ever, it was the first time I'd ever had a desk to use for my writing and reading, to the best of my memory. Unless I have the um, chronology wrong in terms of where I moved and when. Anyway, I was in a overall not happy state about the filth of the place and the fact that we were sharing it with so many people and I don't remember exactly what the, con the further context was but in this fit of not really being happy about things and I'd had this long beard and I just shaved it all for the first time in several years and felt as if I was going through this new period of reinvention. You'll find a motif in my life is this idea of constantly wanting to reinvent myself and improve myself. Uh, and there are different things that are symbolic of steps I take to do that. Anyway, that's all aside. I want to talk to you about the debate. First, 
I do want to make some brief comments about my perspective here because this is not an attempt at like a news program. This is not an attempt to reproduce what someone like Rachel Maddow or Lawrence O'Donnell does. This is not an attempt to sound so much like a radio personality. Uh, I'm trying to really focus on just contemplating policy and politics from the perspective of what I like to call the informed voter. That is to say, I don't, I don't come to you with any kind of I'm really trying to make a headline or anything, or I, I'm just I'm not trying to have quite a newsy feel. I'm trying to have like a really thoughtful feel here. And uh, I have a mission statement that I've been working with. You can check it out on my website, of course, publiccomment.blog, if you are interested. But the gist of it is that uh, my view when it comes to all of my political commentary, my opinion and analysis, is to offer uh, in, I'm reading a here from my notebook, informed voting, keeping elected and appointed officials accountable and visualizing a logical and fact-based policy agenda that provide that promotes and advances justice for all. That's what I go by. The point here that I make with that is I've got a few things that provide for me a very specific focus, a very specific lens through which I analyze our political and policy debates of the day. And that being, first of all, the first thing on my mind is the responsibility I have and that I believe we all have as voters. And so the question I ask myself, first of all, first and foremost, is who in the next upcoming election should I be voting for and why? I believe that is priority. Different political interests and different playing a different role in the various places within the infrastructure of the political process and where each of us fall into our niches there is a conversation to have and everybody's going to have a different angle. My first angle is who to vote for. Whether that person is a candidate for president, congress, town council, governor, etc. Who to vote for. That's my first priority when it comes to thinking about politics. And with that I also like to keep in mind people who are appointed, who should be appointed or not be appointed, or what are our appointed officials up to. And that being said too, also keeping elected officials accountable. So while I'm also thinking about who to vote for, I'm also very interested in just keeping up to date with what's being done by those we have voted for. What is the record they're accumulating? That's another focus point. So again, the way that I perceive these debates is always going to start with this idea of, I mean, it should be obvious, right? In a debate, you're obviously going to be asking like, who won the debate? Who do you want to vote for? But I guess the point that I want to make is that my analysis is not going to be from any perspective other than exclusively me as someone seeking to be an informed voter, just seeking out who I want to vote for or who, where people place in the list of those who I would vote for. Um, which means it's not just about like winning the debate or who had this moment or who had that moment or anything other than that. Just who, how did they fall in place with who I would vote for and why I would vote for based on what I saw in what, how they conducted themselves in the debate. And, you know, it's also, I should say, that for me, why, there are different qualities that I do look for in a candidate and that I look for in an elected official. However, I should tell you that also, if you want to understand my political thinking, it's very important to understand I have two fundamental political principles that sort of outweigh all the other ones. One is the ethics of compassion, which 
so that people don't confuse that with altruism. I believe that compassion is inclusive to self and others, and that the best way to be compassionate to others is to, of course, first be as compassionate with yourself as you can be, so that you're in a good place to be compassionate to others. And so I believe policy should reflect this. And I believe that the political philosophy, uh, with respect to the best concept that I've found in my word bank, if you will, in my lexicon of concepts with respect to political philosophy, the one I go by is what they call social democracy. This idea that as opposed to socialism or democratic socialism, I do believe that the capitalist system, just like the democratic system, although not perfect, uh, needs to be tweaked and made as suitable and practical and ethical as it can be for society, for people. That po so that policy is as compassionate as possible. Right, so those are sort of the contextual things that I really wanted to be clear about with respect to where I stand on how I perceive and analyze and contemplate the debates and political issues in general. Of course, you can learn more about the development of my political philosophy on my blog, publiccomment.blog. Of course, I will provide you with a link to that. Now, let's, let's get to it. Okay, first, which candidates did I connect with least and why did I connect with them least and then I will tell you the candidates I connected with most and why I connected with them the most and then I will also offer a comment on candidates where I want to see more of what they have to say there were things about them that I didn't like but that didn't, that they weren't quite disqualifiers. I thought maybe, I think as my wife put it, maybe they had a bad night. So then there we go. Candidates I connected with the least. First of all, I did not like the former governor of Washington, the present governor of Washington, Jay Inslee. And why did I not like Jay Inslee, Governor Gay, uh, Jay Inslee? Governor Jay Inslee of Washington. The thing I liked about him least of all, which really turned me off, was uh, this came uh, when he was asked how, if president, he would deal with Mitch McConnell. Were the Republicans to keep the Senate and McConnell, therefore, if he were to remain the Senate majority leader? And he said, that we need to take away the filibuster and that would in his opinion uh, make things more politically workable for the democrats i think that is an awful actually destructive and dangerous idea i didn't like it when the republicans took away the filibuster as part of the political process i think that uh any time we are going about an attempt to stifle debate, any time we're going about trying to rush into policy and not let people talk it out uh, to the fullest that our political process can allow them, I think that we're doing just that. We're being overly aggressive. We're stifling debate. We're not showing respect for each other. We're not showing respect for contemplation. I think it's a dangerous idea. I don't advocate it. And I think, frankly, it's disqualifying to me because it th th really to me shows that Inslee thinks about politics as as only this, this um, realm where we need to be, where we need to get pretty close to cheating with how we deal with people we disagree with, how to manipulate the political infrastructure to get advantages over the other party by doing something like taking away the filibuster when we can. And again, stifling debate. 
You know, like what the Republicans have to say. I certainly dislike what the Republicans have to say. I hate a lot of what they have to say, but I would never try to stifle them from saying what they have to say. And I just get the impression that Inslee is not open to having a good, healthy discourse. So that disqualifies him. He's the one I liked the least. One of the ones I liked the least. Another person I did not like, uh, Hawaii Representative Tulsi Gabbard. First of all, and I mean this with all due respect, there are a number of contextual reasons it could be the case that, uh, that are over my head or beyond my capacity to comprehend. However, she came across a lot of times to me, uh, robotic, really, as if she was just memorizing monologues and not really engaged in just talking. Uh, a mistake I've made in the past, if you've watched previous blogs, sometimes they're so over-prepared and written that there's no spontaneity and just in-the-moment-ness in my talking, which is why I do that now. You see, I outline that I don't write a script anymore unless I have a statement that I feel extraordinarily passionate about. But even the way she delivered what sounded like a memorized uh, monologue or bits of memorized monologue or talking points, and this is, I have to admit, something that I have not, I'm not yet able to fully substantiate with... Um, as much detail as I would like. However, I can only say she just struck me as sounding robotic. There was, at several points, a lack of passion in her voice, which I understand could come across as just her being objective or being very cerebral or intellectual in her approach. However, even when, however, when she spoke, I didn't even get that out of her. I got just this sort of, I just didn't connect with her emotionally or feel any intensity from her. Of course, until she started talking about Afghanistan and she really turned me off when she got into a spat with, uh, it was um, the, Representative from Ohio, Representative Tim Ryan. Her and Tim Ryan got into a spat over what to do in Afghanistan because Representative Ryan, he was clear that though our situation in Afghanistan is really frustrating, it's not going to be logical for us to just impulsively have this conversation about immediately withdrawing. He said his, almost verbatim, his point was we need to be more engaged in Afghanistan, whereas Representative Gabbard of Hawaii said, no, we don't need to be more engaged. We need to withdraw, like now. And she talked about how we're not at war with the Taliban, which is as opposed to being at war with al-Qaeda. And Representative Tim Ryan said, well, in fact, it was the Taliban which left a haven for al-Qaeda, and that wasn't enough of a reason to continue fighting with the Taliban, according to Gabbard, a representative Gabbard saying that the ta Taliban is not something we're just going to snap our fingers and make them go away, and therefore it's not worth it to her uh, for us to commit to having a military presence of much substance in Afghanistan. And I've got to say, by the way, I just I don't agree with her. I do think, while it is true, that I would like us to withdraw from Afghanistan as soon as possible. I don't remember the last time I did mention it on this vlog. I know that um, several weeks ago, I did actually prepare a statement about Afghanistan, talking about the fact that, yeah, we do need to get out of Afghanistan. We need to have more conversation about Afghanistan. But I don't believe that the conversation is just about, okay, time to go. 
No, our converse, the conversation we need to have now is what is our strategy to complete our mission in Afghanistan? What does victory in Afghanistan look like? What is our vision? And as Representative Ryan said, it's unacceptable that Trump has not ensured that this is fully taken care of. And we need to, you know, you need to dot your I's and cross all your T's in life, right? We don't want what happened in Iraq to happen, right? What happened in Iraq? We pulled out and then ISIS came and took over because we didn't have enough of a presence there. We just withdrew for political. This is one of the places where Obama did not, where Obama's approach wasn't as great as, a, as other aspects of his presidency was. I think Obama overall, for example, was pretty effective and great on the domestic front. And I think he did some good things with um, showing that, you know, on an international level that we were concerned about our imperialistic past and all that. However, withdrawing from Iraq, the way in which we did only left a vacuum for ISIS to take over and caused further problems and complications for us in the Middle East. So Gabbard's insistence, by the way, she was in the Middle East and she served, I believe, as a medic for our military. So I want to thank Representative Gabbard, not just for her service as a representative, but for her service in the Middle East. And I appreciate the fact that it is very personal and visceral when she talks about the Middle East foreign policy. However, I just think she comes across as not appreciating what happened in the mistake we made with Iraq and not appreciating the fact that it's not enough to simply say, well, there's not much al-Qaeda left in Afghanistan and Afghanistan's just never going to change. I mean, I think that's even kind of a defeatist attitude. True, you can't snap your fingers and change the way a country is, right? If that were the case, then China and Russia would perhaps be very different. But nor does that mean that it's a matter of like just withdrawing and pretty much pushing it aside. I think that withdrawal, again, being a goal, of course, has to be done very thoroughly and methodically and as clean as possible. And it was my perception that in the argument that Representative Gabbard had with Representative Tim Ryan, she was on the losing end of that. So that pretty much disqualified her for me. I wouldn't want her in charge of our, I wouldn't want her to be commander in chief. I mean, I would take her over President Trump, of course. However, I was just not thrilled with her as the top of the candidates in the debate last night. The next candidate who just didn't, I just could not connect with uh, uh, during last night's debate was former, was it HUD, I think? Um, housing, it, it, his exact form, I think it was HUD, his exact former position escapes my mind at the moment. I know that he was part of Obama's prior administration. So one thing I always liked about Castro is that he does have, um, you know, federal experience. I did just want to make sure I was, yeah, he was the former HUD secretary. I got paranoid. Do you ever have something in your mind and you're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is it, but for whatever reason, I'm paranoid of whether or not I had the right fact in mind. I hate when that happens. But thank God for smartphones because you can just sort of double check these things. Not that anyone's perfect. Um, anyway, I was impressed with Castro on a superficial level that he has a kind of form of experience, a field of experience that other candidates don't. He has served in the federal executive branch, his direct executive experience. However, there were just a lot of things I did not like about um, Julian, Julian, Julian Castro. Uh, the first thing I didn't like about him was the fact 
that he came across to me as kind of a grandstander and as if he was sort of excessively cantankerous. Now, he was very passionate about a particular policy last night, and it is worth talking about. I'm glad he brought it up. He is definitely the kind of person who knows how to get people to pay attention about things, and so I think he would be great perhaps to come back on, on in, in serve in the executive branch or uh, do some sort of do, do something in a more activistic arena uh, to bring energy to policies that we need to bring energy to. I think he's very good at that. I, he doesn't strike me as superb in other places though. But um, the specific, I'm looking for it. I should have written it down, but I didn't. I hope you will forgive me. Uh, it was like 2013, section 2013, section. He kept on talking about um, section 1325. There will probably be articles in the Washington Post or something talking about that in, in a little bit more depth than I will t today because I don't want to go on too, too long here. However, it was about what do we do with people at the border? Do we detain them? And what exists within our legal infrastructure to address people crossing the border? And Julian Castro wants to repeal, abolish Section 1325, and he wants to decriminalize crossing the border illegally, I believe was the language that he used. And anyway, he, he just was very, it's not that he was adamant about this that annoyed me. It was the fact that he got almost belligerent towards, for example, Beto O'Rourke, who didn't appear to share quite his view. And he interrupted uh, former representative Beto O'Rourke a lot. And he just came across, frankly, as rude. And I didn't like it. Another point that Castro Ca Castro said something that struck me as again almost like he was playing to pander as opposed to speak with a real sense of objectivity about his interests. I was happy that Castro is pro-choice and I'm happy that Castro supports, you know, the LGBTQ community and that Castro wanted to have a conversation about respecting people in the trans community, for example. However, he, 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 when he talked about being pro-choice, and he said something to the extent of how even trans women should be able to choose about abortion, I just wasn't sure what he meant by that. Now, this isn't something I necessarily am going to hold against him, because I just I don't know what it would mean for a man who feels as if he is a woman to have an abortion. I, is that medically possible? I, I'm just not sure what he was trying to communicate there. And while it could be that I'm ignorant to some extent, I have to say that I also think he just didn't seem to really communicate his message really well there and exactly what he was trying. It was like he was conflating things or mixing things in a way that was trying to maximize the number of people that he was appealing to without really making perfect sense politically or policy-wise. So he just came across to me as trying too hard to appeal and not hard enough to communicate effectively. The last person who falls on my list of people, of candidates last night, that just failed to resonate with me quite significantly was um, mayor of New York City, Bill de Blasio. I should say there are some things I did like about de Blasio, and I know that uh, listening to folks in the media last night on MSNBC, I know Donnie Deutsch, Donnie Deutsch was interesting, and I actually share Donnie Deutsch's assessment because he characterized de Blasio as annoying, but also conceded that de Blasio had a strong night. He was able to inject himself into conversations, Deutsch was saying, and he was assertive. And 
had a strong presence. And those are things that I would grant de Blasio. And I would also say that at certain points, de Blasio was assertive about where he stands on policies. For example, taxing the wealthiest 1% at a top rate of 70%. That was interesting. Uh, he was assertive about it, and he was assertive about the importance of the president going to Congress to get authorization for military combat and things of that nature. So I like that de Blasio was very assertive and that overall he was not, uh, he was not deeply ambiguous. That said, I am not, oh, I'm not yet in a place of comfort to say that we should be taxing anybody 70%. I, and I think that there were times when de Blasio was out to almost scapegoat the rich as a demographic, as opposed to honing in on merely the fact that there are employers out there and people on the upper levels of corporations and things who are clearly exploitive and abusive and are enjoying money as a result uh, and a super abundance of money as a result of excessive concentration um, and consolidation within business and business size. Um, but this idea of super taxation, I'm actually against that. Mind you, I actually consider myself fairly liberal with respect to policies that I consider conducive, especially in the realm of poverty. I despise poverty. I have experienced both poverty that crushes the soul and makes one feel suicidal. I've been there and done that and to a point where I've almost been homeless. So I know what it feels like to worry that within a period of moments I could be on the streets and starve to death. I know what that feels like. I know what that does to the psychology. I know the indignity and I know the cruelty that... I, I know the nature of the cruelty that that... that ignoring the plight that people experience there just uh i the callousness of it and the sort of anti-life mentality that that has to incorporate and i've been on the other side of it i've also been someone who's been in a period of thinking with staunchly libertarian views who who viewed you know thought if you're poor it's your problem and your fault i've been on that side of the ideological spectrum and I've also, I had once inherited a very attractive sum of money from my father when he passed away and was at a time when I didn't have to work for anyone other than myself and wasn't dependent on generating an income other than what I had inherited. And I know what that feels like to feel wealthy. It wasn't a long-term abundance of wealth per se, though had I utilized that money properly, it would have been. Uh, point being that um, I know what it's like. So I'm at the 30 minute mark and I have pretty much just about finished all the candidates I dislike. What I'm going to do is stop this video now and actually go right to starting another video. I just like the idea of having a break and I don't like videos going much longer than 30 minutes. So I'm going to stop this now, make a new video, and they'll continue exactly where I left off.